so on. And, and so we're going to go through and uh, explore some of the topics of where is the state of, uh, of the industry with some of the newest uh, standards and interoperability programs and proven solutions that are already working. And uh, it hopefully be some good information that you can walk away with and take back to your organization. I'm not here to act as the expert today. I'm here to just make sure there's a good conversation between you and the panelists instead of having a canned set of 50 questions and, uh, and, and you hear everything that you already heard this morning. So it's up to you to also ask the good questions and, and, uh, and, get, and get the answers that are going to help you out from the, from the experts. So on your left panel, go to your left and right, we have uh, Addison Snell, who's the keynote this morning. We have um, Mark Stevens from the Active Archive Alliance and also the Board of Directors at Biotech. Molly from uh, uh, Records from Spectrologic, she's on the SA Board of Directors in, in Data, is also on the Active Archive Alliance. You know, I'm on the airplane all the time. <laughs> <laughs> Somewhere. Yeah. You know, Sam Feinberg has been a long time see a volunteer. He's talked here a lot this week about the uh, long term retention technical work group. He's done a lot of work in the object oriented storage area immunity attributes that were the, the same today and, and so on. He's also done tutorials on Hadoop and Big Data and how does it really work from a, from a different viewpoint about uh, applying it to this area. And we have Thomas Rivera has been with a number of companies uh, out with the talk to data uh, long term uh, tutorials feature on data protection, uh, deduplication, capacity optimization, and, and other type of data management across the, the field here, there's a, you know, we always have to, if there's enough gray hair people to talk to say there's over 100 years of experience sitting up here. So I don't know if we want to go for 200 years or not. But, uh, so, that's, so that's where we're at. Um, so I, I asked my panelists to say, what question do you want to have asked? And given today, I didn't ask it three times to get a response. And so uh, I only got one response. And Sam says, why don't you ask? How does the long-term retention factor into big data and maybe cloud? And they will use that as a, a first data point of uh, you know, what is long-term retention as it, as it could apply to big data. So, um, so yes. Yeah, so one of the pieces that uh, I've been working on for a while now in C is uh, looking at uh, retaining uh, information over long periods of time. And then one of the things that makes it fairly similar to what happens with um, data is that you know, what things that make it hard to keep data over time is when you have uh, amounts of data that are kept for long periods of time, uh, you have more of a chance of having issues in the data, more uh, opportunities for, um, for corruption in the data and other, other uh, difficulties to keep the data from uh, intact and accessible. And uh, with large amounts of data, you number one, you Big data often does require you to also keep it over long periods of time, but also the size also makes it more likely that you can have bit error and other kinds of problems similar to what happens in retaining periods for data for long periods of time. So uh, we've, we've been trying to uh, come up with solutions in, in our work at SNEA uh, for preserving information, and, uh, and lately we've been uh, applying those to uh, big data and, and uh, the cloud as well. Just to, to take it a different point, like a lot of times when we hear big data, it's like, you know, it's not a new, new, new space, but there's like the three Ds of volume, velocity, and value. You can derive the informational value out of it. And so when you think about like volume and, 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 and uh, velocity, it starts to feel like, well, if I don't, uh, you know, save this data, there's another batch that's coming in pretty fast. So I'm not waiting another week. So how, how would like long-term retention be of high interest in typical types of Projects that are that are new. I know, like earlier today, one of the speakers talked about data warehouses, and, and obviously the financial areas. You have to need to save data for for a period of time. But it's, it's like, you know, a lot of people are thinking about these new ways of uh, uh, mashing up social media with traditional structured data to look at a different way of uh, addressing the market. Yeah, I, I would agree that you know the volume and uh, the Velocity is probably not as critical in most archives um, unless if it's something that uh, you know has some immediate active use. But um, it's definitely the, the volume, the variety um, is are definitely big issues in the uh, in, in retaining information. Does anyone else on the panel want to add? Yes. 
player needs to play fresh in there? Yes, certainly, uh, you know, highly dependent upon the organization that has all this data that we're talking about, i.e. big data. For some, uh, Sam sort of alluded to the, the concept of, well, velocity isn't always necessarily the attribute that's the most important. Depending on the company that's actually uh, matching the data, if you will, or doing the analytics on the data, it could be of utmost importance. It just depends on their application. So for example, there are companies that actually make a living out of real-time analytics. And I think Molly and Addison and a few others actually alluded to some of those examples this morning, where there are companies that actually are making decisions that could be hopefully, in, in their mind, uh, affecting their bottom line revenue uh, real time. Things like uh, uh, who's uh, buying what product at what time based on some external uh, uh, external um, activities such as a hurricane, for example. I think Molly used that example this morning. Uh, and those, that would be an example where the attribute of velocity of the data is gonna be important. Why? Because they have to be able to do deal with the analytics of that data at the appropriate rate that uh, that data is being ingested into the into their environment. One of the other considerations that <clears throat> we'll sometimes see is, is the cost of the storage or the cost of the computing, the answer, more expensive? And in some cases, having the compute resource available to recalculate the answer is not an option, and you have to store the data. In other cases, it's a much better deal to just run the problem, calculate the answer, and don't store anything because you can always run the, que the question again. So sometimes we see on the compute versus storage side, there's a trade-off based on which resource you have more access to. Yeah, the, there's always the question of use cases, right? And, and we can find plenty of them where the data stays active and useful for a, a very long time. I always hesitate to say forever. Uh, 10 years ago when Chris Willard was training me on how to be an analyst, having my marketing background, he referred to himself as the adjective police, and uh, quickly pointed it out in the first product call we were ever on where the company that was pitching its technology to us claimed that it had a nearly infinite amount of storage available, and he asked the pointed question, can you give me an example of a number that is nearly infinite? Uh, <laughs> which I just love. So forever is a very long time, but uh, let's see, in last year's data, 8% 8, 8 of end users said that their data stayed active and useful at least for decades. And if you ask how long is it archived, of course that percentage goes up. And the challenge in all of that is that really you're, you're talking about inevitably where you're going to be multiple generations of technologies and a lot of new, uh, Approaches to how to store and access data that we haven't even envisioned. Uh, you know, consider the case of a pediatric hospital is maybe my favorite one, and you've got a, a, a brain scan or what have you from a two-year-old, which you know that you're going to want to keep for at least the life of the patient and possibly some years beyond that. Well, how long do you intend for this toddler to live, right? Uh, you know, here's an example of uh, data that you have to reasonably plan that you're going to be able to access for about a century, maybe a little bit longer. So what does that mean? Um, it means that you need to be prepared for the idea that you're going to need to migrate this multiple times through new storage mechanisms, new algorithms, new standards, and that's exactly coming around to Wayne's point where you get the role of the community and of consortia like SNEA because what you'd like to do is attempt to thoughtfully plan approaches so that when inevitably something gets to where it needs to come forward, hopefully that's not as painful as it might be if otherwise. There's always going to be some pain in that, but you know, imagine how we were storing data 50 years ago. And you know, you'd like to do that a different way today without it being so painful. I think health, the healthcare record example you bring up is a, is a, is a great one. Um, other ones, I think, are video security and surveillance, right? It's an exploding area. Uh, Molly talked about it a little bit sure. in her presentation, right? Where the, there's, there's probably, as fast as 
storage is growing, the number of cameras that are deployed out there that are streaming stuff where you don't know what they're capturing and if that's going to be important down the road and if it's going to be important a, a day from now, a week from now, a month from now, a year from now for litigation, someone coming back and suing you saying I was at you know, your concert at this large venue and I was accosted in this hallway at, at this time. And you're going to want to not just have the last 60 days of, of video, you're going to want to go back to that camera on that day and have be able to pop that up and say, no, you weren't. Here's the video from that time. Could be worth millions of dollars to you, sure. right? So. There are any number of wonderful examples. I'm quite sure there are modern organizations that would pay a considerable sum of money for accurate records of baseball games played professionally in the 1890s. You know, and we just didn't have it then. And is baseball going to be around 100 years from now? And are sabermetricians of the future going to want to compare against today? I mean, people want this data. And that's, you know, a cheap and easy example. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think there are actually a lot of, uh, the, what you were talking about with medical records, I think is a great example. And also in scientific data in general, having the ability to look at hundreds of years of, uh, of records to be able to do analytics across across time are I think are critically important to, to making new discoveries. So any questions from the audience that uh, someone had something at lunch? And so you go to uh, could maybe you could introduce the context of who you are too. My name is Sula Sura from Toshiba. Okay, so you okay. Um, the first thing is regarding every software in the world, you know, now, you know, we have done a lot of work on the software environments. So every company implements and their own algorithm and designs and everything. And the government imposes a lot of, you know, uh, compliances, rules, regulations, financial companies have a different type of, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, restoration policy or uh, keeping the data for this many years, 70 years or 60 years like that. So in big data scenario, what kind of a compliance model is going to come, or is there any kind of a new models are going to be available, you know, soon available to look into the big data? Because the big data is varieties we talked about it. So what kind of a compliance model is going to be? Because that must be some kind of a boundaries has to be there. Otherwise, people keep analyzing everything, whatever they want, whatever they can do, kind of a model. Some people may be not happy about it. We have seen a couple of times in the news about Google and other companies. Uh, so is there any standards that are going to be there in the future? Well, in the Standard, I want to make sure I understand your question. Are you looking for standards for compliance with respect to regulation as to what types of data ought to be allowed yeah. to be analyzed? That's right. Okay. Um, so I already sort of rephrased the question. Um, it's a hot topic that's debated in the popular press right now. How much of the data about me out there is mine? Uh, who, who was it? One of the popular CEOs these days said privacy's dead, get over it. It's Zuckerberg or somebody. Is it Zuckerberg? I, I don't want to misquote him, but it, if it wasn't Mark Zuckerberg, it was somebody like him, um, you know, Larry Page or somebody. No so. more privacy. No more, yeah, forget it. You, don't say no more <laughs> <laughs> you know, people complain about Facebook. I'm very dissatisfied with my free service that nobody makes me use. Uh, I, privacy is going to become a very different thing. It's, it's difficult to analyze data in the aggregate without giving somebody access to the data point in the specific. Yeah. And this is coming to a head most rapidly with regards to medical data uh, because you want to go through all of the medical records for interesting trends without violating HIPAA compliance in the United yeah. States or other regulations nationwide. And I think that's going to set some interesting precedents in terms of how can I access the data at large for the good of humankind and, and assure that the individual data points are anonymized to the point where I can't act on any of them. And that will set precedent in other industries. The next industry where there's just a lane of regulation about to come down is in finance. Uh, regulations <coughs> can hit this industry like God's own thunder and lightning. 
uh, with regards to high frequency trading, quote stuffing, algorithmic trading, risk analysis, intraday risk modeling, etc. cetera. Uh, and the regulation at first is probably going to exceed the technical capabilities of most of the people trying to follow it. The most interesting um, current case, however, is the is the, the, the Gmail case that's already in uh, in the news in some places where, uh, geez, one of the attorneys on it, you know, G Google's uh, uh, point is that you know they're just trying to use your data so that you get a personalized experience when you log in and read your mail. And the opposing attorney said, there's no getting around the fact that Google as a co company is reading every word in every one of your emails for both meaning and context <coughs> without restriction as to what they can do with that information, which I think is a very important point. So that is also going to have precedent. Um, do I think there should and will be regulation? Yes, I think there should and will be regulation. I don't think you're going to stop analytics in general. I think the fundamental question is how do you separate the aggregate from the specific? So I'm analyzing the school of fish, but not any specific fish unless it volunteers. Yeah, I think the anonymization of data, I hope that's the word. I, I might have just made that up. But, uh, Analysts uh, use the word anonymization all the time, yeah, good, which makes it real. Absolutely. <laughs> I'll claim it's real even though I'm not. If you're ready for your next job, you've got the lingo back. Beautiful. But you've got the lingo down. But uh, I think that's going to be key is uh, being able to segregate the actual data from the person or user, in the case of email, that actually wrote the original email and making sure that it doesn't get tied back to that user, in this case, that wrote the email. I think you're gonna see some, some movements from a regulatory standpoint on that. One other point that I'd like to make, too, is uh, interesting things are happening in the EU, the, the European Union, where they have uh, uh, all the com countries that are part of the EU uh, have a governing body, if you will, that have that set data privacy uh, regulations that will affect obviously all countries in, in the European Union. Interestingly enough, that's not actually going to affect other companies that are not necessarily based in the EU. A lot of people, uh, number one, don't realize that. Number two, they're, they're going to soon realize that their respective company may in fact be charged with specific regulatory uh, allegations, even though they're not part of the EU. The only piece that ties them to the European Union is they have some piece of their business that takes place in one of the countries in the European Union. Why I bring that up is, uh, and by the way, those uh, regulations are still being written, supposedly uh, to be placed into the law by next year, 2014. But I think that's also going to have a, a ripple effect to many companies uh, globally. Uh, so another interesting thing to look out for in the future. Coming back to the question that was raised, though, about like, um, is there any standard or anything going on? And so what's triggered in my mind is that there's been a lot of work done in different bodies on uh, metadata and then working on containers that have what I would call fields that, that are being used for exchange on helping with the data management side of it and the data protection side without getting into the application. And then there's a open-ended fields that could be used by a specific company or application or, or another type of uh, industry trade area that says, okay, let's use the, the, the balance of this metadata fields to define other attributes that, that would be in here. So I was thinking that might be another data point to elaborate on. Point. So I'll, I'll start off. I'm sure there's a, a few others uh, that want to point out a few things on this. So as a co-chair of the Data Protection Committee within SNEA, we actually, uh, as a committee, we're actually involved with uh, a number of standards, some of which are actually uh, being uh, written by members of the Storage Networking Industry Association. Uh, so um, part of what we do as a committee 
uh, specifically related to data protection is we um, apply certain thought processes to some of the other standards that are being written outside of uh, our specific committee. So for example, um, and I think this is what Wayne is sort of alluding to, so for example, CBMI, there are a couple of references this morning to the CBMI. Does everybody know what CBMI is? Okay, so the acronym is Cloud Data Management Interface, and it's one of the uh, standards being written uh, by the um, uh, Cloud Storage uh, Committee within uh, uh, within SNEA. And part of my committee, the Data Protection Committee, is uh, actually assisted in part of the CBMI spec and, and as it relates to data protection. The CBMI actually covers many different things outside of data protection, but that's one of the things that um, as a data protection committee, we, we uh, helped to uh, assist and author uh, that specific specification. Uh, another one that comes to mind, and it's been around for quite a while now, in terms of number of years, is the SMIS. So I'm sure, has anybody heard of SMIS specification? So that one's been uh, written uh, within SNEA uh, for a number of years. They're uh, up to uh, almost Rev uh, 2.0, soon to be anyway. I think it's at 1.6 right now. There's also specification of uh, the SMI uh, details of the spec that uh, has to do with data protection. So, for example, tags, uh, tags within SMI that, that specifically relate to data protection. Uh, the Data Protection Committee within SNEA actually helped author some of that specification within the SMI spec. So th those are a couple of examples where uh, we assist other committees within the SNEA organization uh, as it relates to uh, specific uh, <coughs> uh, items that are being worked on from a specification standpoint. To, to maybe follow up on that question, there was a question in one of the earlier sessions, I think that's almost a little bit related to on the data protection side of things that came up, um, and I don't know that we really addressed it in that session, but it, it came up in terms of objects placed in object stores, right, that have metadata, um, I don't want to paraphrase the question, but it was it, almost attributes within the objects themselves, right? That would make it from a security perspective self-describing in me, and of itself, right? Let me phrase it differently. That you wrap a functional layer, the object layer is a functional layer with functional operands that you can apply a security policy to. This is actually a storage firewall sort of built into this functional layer around each set of data files. And um, this is, a, this, is, this, is, this was implemented 10 years ago. We have the patents on it. Love to share them with you. We can explain how it works. It's, it's out in the real world. It's been used in embedded systems. It's not today being used in the data center. It could be. It would have to be modified somewhat. Uh, fit all the different standards for interfaces. The point is that you can then apply security policies that protect privacy or protect longevity. And you can modify the policies over time and still have operands that you can get at 100 years from now to ask them to give you back a document. You don't have to worry about how the document's being stored inside the object. You only care that you get back a bit perfect version when you ask for that, <coughs> that, that data component back 100 years or 1,000 years from now. Does that make sense? Good. Yeah. And I'll be on one of your panels next year if you want. But it comes back to metadata. <laughs> some, yes. some, some things that the, the industry can agree to. I know, like in the, in the coming back to the healthcare, there's, there's application level metadata that goes into how the, how much of a health record can be shared between um, patient billing and between the different uh, providers and, and that are sharing the, the, the patient information to, to help them to diagnose the treatment. So there's because connection at different levels. Of, of right. Health. Because connection companies are like banks are trading with other customers. They go to the severe companies. Now we are talking about big data, so for that is definitely interesting. Yeah, so it's it's going to come back to you know, you know some some of these metadata aspects get forced by regulation. So like the SEC forced a lot of yeah. new metadata around e-discovery and, and, and then a new ability about the, the the client transactions with their broker. And, and so there was a new ability.
that's a critical point. The regulation can short circuit standards. You know, the, someone makes a court ruling and they can invalidate 20 years of work on an industry standard because it no longer fits where the industry wants to go. There are some real ethical and legal questions that need to be addressed very carefully in the, in the next decade. Yeah, no. another, another question? Yeah, I'm Larry Gordon from the Back Fund Review. This is a storage account, so everybody's interested in storing all the data for, uh, you know, in the cosmic eternity, but if this was a legal conference, <clears throat> there'd probably be discussions about, you know, the impact of big data on the uh, statutes of limitation, and sure. there, there's probably a new field of you know, forensic liability where somebody could go back <laughs> and nail you for something you did 15 right. years ago, and once they, the, you know, understand fraud patterns and financial transactions, they can go back and do, you know, grandiose analysis against, you know, billions of transactions, and, and all of a sudden, you know, there's criminals everywhere. So, so the, um, the, the you know, corporations have always been interested in, you know, encouraging employees to purge their files and get rid of stuff. And I'm, I'm thinking that, you know, this, there's this edge case of where do you draw the line and how do you separate data Right, and part of the reason why they're afraid to keep it is, as you sort of alluded to, the, the legal aspect. In other words, uh, is it a potential for litigation in the future? So just one example, and I, I think uh, uh, we have a couple other comments that uh, I'm sure will be made, but one example would be uh, email systems within companies. Uh, is it, can you think of any reason why a lot of the companies that we talk to specifically will not only have limits on the size of each individual's mailbox within the company, that's pretty common, uh, but they also have uh, internally within the company uh, policy by which their email is purged after X number of years. Why is that? Anybody have any ideas why? Right, and some people, some companies do pick seven years, not all companies, some pick five years. It, it, it's not so much the number of years, but any any reasons can you think of why a company would have a reason to make sure that their email is purged after X number of years? Yeah, potential for litigation, basically. So when, when uh, litigation takes place, it, up against a judge, and the judge has the ability to allow opposing counsel to do a request for data of the uh, company that's being sued. Uh, and that judge says, you know, you're allowed to basically get the data that's available. Guess what? Even if that data may not be related to that specific lawsuit, well, if they find data that uh, uh, yeah, sort of in some way binds that company liable for something else, that that's fair game from a legal perspective. And that's why companies will in, sort of set up their own policies to make sure that they won't keep email for more than a certain period of time to uh, lessen that the litigation possibility. You know, I think this topic, it's, and it's interesting when you have security people and folks from the corporate side and the litigation side, I mean, that's really the root of percent of data isn't being created by corporations, it's being created by users. Mm -hmm. Corporations want to control what happens with that data because <coughs> of all these reasons, worries about security, litigation, those types of things. I don't think corporations have that choice anymore. I've sat in conferences on CMI um, and standards group and IEEE trying to control users from using Dropbox, from putting in um, pictures of their peers on Facebook. You can't stop it. Um, and I think that's going to be the root of what happens in corporate America over the next <coughs> five years or so is I don't think corporate America is going to be able to control the data because it's not coming from the corporations by and large anymore. Um, it's, it's, it's a tough question, you know, it's, and I think it's one that you're going to start to see the successful companies who are IPOing and making a lot of money are going to be less concerned about it than our Fortune 500s are. And it's 
going to change our economy pretty dramatically. And I don't belittle the comments because it's true. I'm just as worried about my own personal information as anyone is. But I don't think litigation rules are going to be able to control it anymore. Actually, one of the interesting twists in that um, is that uh, there's the law hasn't quite caught up on it, but there's actually issues around what happens if you have relevant corp information about a corporation that's relevant to some legal matter that uh, that isn't in control of that corporation. So say I've got information that's in Google that's relevant to something um, at another company, and they and the, someone wants to use that in their lawsuit. Um, to some extent, you know, if corporations are responsible for being able to produce the information that uh, that's requested, but uh, if they don't have the ability to compel Google to produce it, there's, there's actually an issue there. And uh, that's the kind of thing that it's, it's going to happen more and more with all of these um, all these public web services out there that allow you to generate, allow you to do all sorts of things without uh, any any corporate controls on it. Uh, even people who try to control their so-called digital footprint will find there's so much information about them that's just out there in the world that you can do nothing about from, you know, look into the very near future, look into, you know, the RFID chip in your driver's license or your smart license plate, your all your credit card purchases, what you're watching on TV, tracking your phone in your pocket as you move around. You know, does Citibank have of responsibility to the government if they think that I've made a train a, a chain of purchases that indicates I might be at risk for create, or, uh, committing a terrorist act or a, a predatory act against a child, right? Does it matter if I'm famous? Does it matter if I'm going to run for public office? You know, what is my right to privacy? How far does it extend? <laughs> and these are just because the data hasn't been there before, hasn't been created or accessible, we haven't wrestled with these questions yet. And you can argue either side of that, that argument pretty convincingly. Another question from the audience? Yeah, the government's good information. Good information. Good information. Good information. Good information. That thing about a terrorist act was just an example, guys. So just well. yeah, we're the NSA. All right, all right. We, we do have a real question in the back. All right. These have been real questions. They just don't have a lot to do with storage. Well, could you hold? We do have a, a question from the back. I'm going to be queuing people up. But we'll see. Go ahead. Yeah, the, just beyond the level of legal authority I or I think any of our panelists have to discuss it. I, if we really want to, I mean, this would be a great idea for a panel, but you should put a bunch of lawyers. Right? <laughs> <laughs> and the recording of that. <laughs> okay, question over here. Uh, yeah, so you know, this has been a, an interesting conversation. You know, you know, some of my nets out, out of it are, you know, clearly there are a lot of policy issues. Should data be kept forever, should data be time limited, whatever, and I'm sure different organizations, different industries will have different policies around that. Um, also, you know, I think it's pretty clear the amount of data is going to be increasing enormously no matter what we say here. You know, the 
economic incentives to collect all sorts of data are, are, are just absolutely compelling. So, but as I look at the landscape, there are a lot of just, um, you know, it's creating great opportunities for lots of small companies to come up with point solutions to deal with all of these problems. Um, and, you know, and that's fine, and maybe you know, we're really at the cusp of some uh, new, new wave of innovation here. But from a standards point of view, is there something going on such that we don't have this eclectic collection of all sorts of point solutions, and that a lot of the policy issues and volume issues that we've been talking about here can be addressed un under some standards framework? That's a great question. So from an innovation standpoint, one of the objectives of standards bodies is to not interrupt this, the, the actual innovation in and of itself. The, the, the real key, especially for the standards that are being worked, uh, that we're involved with, have to do with the ability to specify attributes that are going to be important. Uh, you mentioned a few, just for example, the you know, retention, you know, the ability to, to specify retention, just as an example. Uh, we make sure that those are specified in a standard so that uh, those people that are doing the innovation out there can actually apply whatever they're doing from an innovation standpoint to a standard that has all the respective attributes applied already as long as they apply to that standard. There's typically the ability though for third party companies to do their own thing and have what they call extensions to the standard over and above what the standard already has listed uh, as specific attributes. And, and that's common, right? We've seen many companies that do specific things over and above the standard, but they're still supporting the quote standard. They're just doing some additional things on top of that standard, uh, which allows uh, innovation to continue to take place. In the future, some of those interesting things that they innovated may in fact become part of the standard in the future. The idea, though, is uh, as a standards body, we want to make sure that we're not hindering innovation. We just want to make sure that the in important attributes are allowed to be uh, specified within the standard. Right. And also, when you when you look at you know most of these kinds of policy decisions are the kind of things that are going to be made by legal by lawyers, or they're going to be made by lawmakers or, or public in general, or public policy. And so um, what you need to do is you need to provide the ability, the mechanisms that allow you to enforce those policies that, that, that make sense for, that are, that are put in place. So you have to have the ability to provide metadata so you understand the attributes. You have to have the, uh, you have to have um, enough information, enough context to be able to, uh, to, to be able to make those decisions. And, uh, and that's really what we see as being Storage in the, in the storage infrastructure, and then the actual policy is, is made and some business rules put on top of that. Yeah, the, well, I guess two, two pieces to it. I, I think the whole metadata, you've heard that term bounced around a lot here. And I get a more and more and more events where metadata is going to be the key to this whole thing. And we're in a, a metadata valley right now, right? And that we've got all this payload of stuff that's built up this debt of, of untagged data that's sitting out there essentially now, right? So there's, going forward, if you think about systematic data, things coming off the of sequencers, me medical information being generated, I call it systematic data. It's being generated by a system that can actually shove into it a lot of intelligent metadata that will carry along with it. Then you have unsystematic data, a lot of times research data, research projects, things that go on at universities, all kinds of stuff where that, that's a huge problem in terms of how do you tag that stuff? How do you motivate somebody to want to tag that stuff such that when they all leave the university and go and do whatever they want to do, you don't have this stuff that nobody knows what it is, but no one's, uh, everyone's too afraid to delete it because we've had it forever and oh, that was the work that that guy did. And we don't know what it is, but man, I don't want to be the one that pulls the trigger and, and hits delete. So yeah, I think this metadata tagging and finding a way to go back through a lot of this legacy stuff that's out there that's untagged, that 
we're either going to store and have value with it, or you should just toss, right? And it's like the stuff you put in the storage unit, but you don't know what's in those boxes. And you pay every month, and you never haven't been there in 10 years. It's like, what, should I just stop paying and, you know, let them, let them get rid of it? Question or comment? I have a question slash comment that relates back right to what Mark just said. Ana analytics and big data. Look, um, uh, well, uh, I don't know if it's possible, but it seems reasonable that we take all this unstructured, unmetted data, and we can now run big data analysis on it, find correlations, find duplicates, find, uh, find ways to then begin to tag it with the correlations we find with other pieces of data across that organization. Um, and, I, and I think there's an opportunity there to the, you know, to the comment that was on the small companies. And as you go with the standards, I think the other piece is, you know, coming from a you know, smaller company myself, you know, you've always got to look, if you're a small company, of saying, what's the compelling reason for me to want to spend time to support this standard, right? Versus doing what I just got to do to close business, sell product, solve the customer problem I see in front of me, that this guy's telling me he solved this and I'll give you X, X dollars and keep going, or I can do the high and mighty good thing which is support the standard, but it's kind of like, okay, then my thing becomes compatible with what everybody else has, and I'm not sure that that's a good thing for me, right? Because if, if I'm small and innovative and I have exactly what the guy who's big and powerful has, then guess who's gonna lose, right? When you go into those, those battles. So there's some always gonna be that push and pull for innovative small companies to be saying, I'm gonna do the extensions, I'm gonna kinda ride the ragged edge a little bit and kinda say, the reason you wanna go with me is I give you this bit that nobody else can, can give you. But uh, you're exactly right, but I, I think it even extends beyond small companies to large companies currently. And this is the Wild West out there. Yeah, that's right? a great point. I mean, you could go, take something like Yum Brands is a huge company, right? Huge consumer company. But down at the level where someone who's testing pricing for Long John Silver's franchises is trying to figure out whether the new McDonald's fish bites is going to have an impact on pricing and in what proximity markets is an enormous big data problem and standards are the last thing on their mind when they conceive of how they're going to go after this. This is just, you know, the CEO one day said to the IT guy, Hey, can you go figure out whether this is a problem? And they passed it down the chain until someone got stuck with the potato. <laughs> and, and can you do it by next Thursday? Yeah. And that person coming back and saying, well, great news. I never got the data, but I got a little bit of data, but it's so standard. You're going to love it. It's They're so... going to hack something together yeah. and try to answer the question. And if they do it really well, they'll say, great, can you do more? Can you make it bigger? Can you do it again? And you get these little internal things that scale out in ways God never intended to try to understand how we're going to sell more fried fish. Yeah. And, you know, and it's not tied into this committee or, or that standard. I, it's just not the way that it starts. Where I do think there's an opportunity where standards might play a role, and this happened with other major tech initiatives like ERP, is we're kind of in this wave of a lot of people are now jumping on saying, hey, I've got to do it, I don't really know how. The consultants start helicoptering in, you know, trailing their briefcases on ropes, and you know, they'll start trying to do some sort of prefab, we can look at your data and help you understand it. Um, and they can try to routinize it a little bit, but there's so many different types of big data problems that even that's hard to Master. I mean, the problem of ingesting a 150 terabyte file is a lot different from the problem of managing uh, 15 billion separate inodes, right? And that's before you get into the timeliness of the data or anything else. How many people have to access it, etc. Okay, um, we, we're out of time for our panel. We do have uh, time to come up informally and to talk with our, our panelists, and then uh, yeah, we're going to take. Then we're on break, and then at, at, uh, in 15 minutes we go into the breakout sessions, which are arranged in uh, different rooms. So uh, I'd like to thank the panelists for sharing your knowledge with us today. Uh, feel free to come up and uh, ask some more personal questions. Or, uh, well, I'm going to ask you uh, personal, personal data. <laughs> <laughs>